The feud between Congresswoman Ilhan Omar and Lauren Boebert seems to show no signs of stopping. It all began last week when Boebert bragged she taunted Omar by suggesting she was a suicide bomber and calling her a part of the Jihad squad on a Capitol Hill elevator. Omar accused Boebert of bizarrely making the whole thing up and called her a buffoon. Boebert later apologized to the Muslim community for her comments, and the two had a scheduled phone call to discuss their differences, which quickly went south. The call ended when Omar, quote, hung up after Boebert allegedly refused to apologize. In an Instagram video, Boebert said, quote, Omar still wanted a public apology because what I had done wasn't good enough. She went on to say, I told Ilhan Omar she should make a public apology to the American people for her anti-American, anti-Semitic, anti-police rhetoric. Team Rising is here to weigh in. Jennifer Holdsworth Carp is a Democratic strategist and owner of JC Strategies. Rachel Bovard is the policy director at the Conservative Partnership Institute. Glad to have both of you with us. Good morning. Good morning. And so, uh, R Rachel, this this is now spreading this morning. Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, is going after Nancy uh, Mace. Nancy May is going after Nancy Mace and. What began as a situation where Boebert was apologizing essentially for using this phrase jihad squad, she apologized to the whole Muslim community. She turned out she did not, in fact, use that phrase in the elevator. She used it, uh, you know, she, she pretended that she had used it. Uh, you, know, it you know, it's sort of like George Costanza figuring out what, what was his, what was George Costanza's comeback? Uh, the jerk store is, is run, running out of you. <laughs> running like, out of you. It's like that, that, that quality of, of riff that she came up with after she left the elevator. She, oh, that's what I should have said. And so then when she met with people back in Colorado, she pretended that she had actually said that. So then she apologizes. But now you have Marjorie Taylor Greene using the phrase Jihad Squad again uh, telling a, a fellow Republican congressman that she should join the Jihad Squad. So in a matter of days, they've gone from apologizing for using the phrase to now using it, just casually. Uh, where, do you, where, does, where does this end? Is this something that Kevin McCarthy thinks is a problem for him and, he, and he's going to try to clamp down on? Or is he too worried uh, that anything that he does upsets the delicate balance that leads him to become speaker? I mean, look, the House is going to be the House, and this is the House being full on a peak House, which is just slinging mud at each other. And let's be clear, because, you know, Lauren Boebert, I think, actually used Jihad Squad on the House floor uh, during the censure resolution uh, of Paul Gosar. So this is, uh, you know, she may apologize for the comment she made in the elevator, but I don't think the phrase Jihad Squad is going to go away as evidenced this morning, I think, by the tweet from Marjorie Taylor Greene. But this sort of is, again, you know, a house modus operandi. You don't think this is going to benefit both sides, that you just have been paying attention for the last 200 years of the House of Representatives. Uh, Ilhan Omar is going to raise a dump truck of money off this, and so is Lauren Boebert, and the House continues apace. This is just how, how the game is played there. Yeah, Jennifer, I, I think it's, uh, I want, you're probably going to agree with this, but I, I think it's funny that, you know, people on the right will try to nitpick over, like, using the term insurrection. Well, it wasn't technically ins insurrection because the government wasn't actually threatened. It was a riot, if they're even going to concede that. But then they're freely using the word jihad squad to describe <laughs> Democratic politicians. I mean, the hypocrisy is just really galling. Yeah, I mean, I take a little bit of an issue that this is just the normal course of business in the House. This is beyond the pale. I mean, this is indicative of the complete moral decay of the Republican Party um, and their supporters. And, and I won't say the right in general. I have plenty of policy disagreements with the right. I have plenty of policy disagreements with the squad. This is abject racism, and it doesn't belong on the floor of the House. Lauren Boebert doesn't belong in Congress. Mar Marjorie Taylor Greene doesn't belong in Congress. Paul Gosar doesn't belong in Congress. This is an awful, awful trend that has been happening to the right for the last 20 years. And to, to even call this a feud, I think, is a little bit of a misnomer. This is Lauren Boebert being outwardly Islamophobic, outwardly homophobic, and pretending that she's some kind of stand-up comedian uh, instead of actually doing her job and trying to deliver some kind of results for her district instead of just you know playing comedian on Twitter. She's a professional troll. That's all she is. And this is just completely indicative of where the Republican Party is right now. And of course, Kevin McCarthy's not saying anything. This is the Republican Party. 
This is the party that Donald Trump leads. This is the party that he actually wants to be speaker for if, God forbid, the Republicans take back the House in 2022. So this is not just a symptom. This is the disease. I think that's a fair point that this isn't exactly a, a feud. You know, this is something that, you know, you know, Boebert, you know, at this event in Colorado, you know, decided to tell this story. And then when she got on the phone to apo to apologize with Omar, you know, insisted that Omar should actually be the one apologizing for for being anti-American. I, I, Rachel, I think your point isn't that this is not beyond the pale, but more that the House has been beyond the pale for a lot of its history or a lot of House members have been beyond beyond the pale. Is that is that uh, would you agree with that? Yes, I really sort of struggle and, and cringe when people talk to me about the dignity of the House of Representatives. You can only make that comment if you have never been watching the House of Representatives. You know, since its inception, members were brawling and drunk and dueling and, you know, slapping each other around. And even in this modern era, I mean, you've had members, you know, like Cynthia McKinney, another member from Georgia, being a 9-11 truther, you know, on the House floor, blaming it on the Zionists. Elsie Hastings, an impeached judge, impeached by the Senate, had a long and distinguished career in the House of Representatives. May he rest in peace. So this idea that, you know, uh, there should be an HR department for who gets to serve in Congress is just not compatible with what democracy is. The one thing I do agree with Jennifer on is that, yes, these, these members of Congress should be promoting their ideas. They should be trying to actually do things that matter. But that's just, the, you know, the House minority has no power to do that at all, less so under this uh, majority that, you know, this Pelosi Congress, which is their right as the majority, but they have stripped every single right from the minority. They have no power to implement any kind of policy. Doesn't mean they shouldn't put their ideas forward. But at the same time, this is a Democratic majority that on the same day it was announced that 100,000 Americans have died from opioid abuse, spent the entire day censuring Paul Gosar over a meme. Censure resolutions in the House used to be reserved for actual secessionists and members who couldn't keep their hands off the House pages. And now we censure them left and right, strip them of committees, you know, when people get offended about actually outrageous statements, because politics is full of outrageous statements. It would be great if the House could get back to doing its business. I highly doubt you're going to see it uh, in the future, because this is apparently what, you know, we've devolved into in the Congress. Yeah, I think the only real censure at this point can come from internally inside a person's party you know the one one party censuring the other is is only i think going to be a performance for that party's base but and that but that goes back to the first question i i asked you which is you know how are republicans going to handle this and the cynthia mckinney is a good example democrats you know primaried cynthia mckinney you know from the right from the center right and and knocked her out of office hank johnson now you know a moderate <laughs> kind of Democrat now serves in that district. He's interesting in his Hank, own right, but he's not. I was just going to say, yeah. Hank Johnson sort of took on the legacy and mantle of Cynthia McKinney in some ways. <laughs> but but not but not in the more like Bush did 9-11 kind of kind of ways. And so Democrats have been over the last couple generations, you know, much more effective at kind of for better or for worse purging the, that element of the party. So is the Republican Party able to do that anymore or it, are, are Boebert and, and Green going to be kind of, you know, moderate Republicans, uh, you know, five, 10 years from now? I do think you will see a split in the Republican base. Well, not necessarily the base, but the political operation, you know, around these members. I think you will see people like Liz Cheney, who I think put money against her own colleagues in some primaries. So you will see members try to do that. But I think overall, you know, there's just this belief you know, th there's a little bit of, of policing that goes on in the Republican conference. But again, there is this commitment to the fact that, OK, you the voters of Georgia, the voters of Colorado have sent me these members. You know, it is their job uh, to decide what's appropriate behavior from the members who represent them. So I do think the political machine in Washington will respond as it always does. Right. It, it's it's a self-protecting sort of self-licking ice cream cone in that sense. So, you know, you'll probably see some machine politics on that end. But at the end of the day, I come back to this idea that I believe very strongly in that it is the voters who make these decisions and this sort of, you know, knocking people off left and right is not for Washington politics to decide. It's for the voters who sent these women here. Jennifer, is there any impulse among uh, Democrats or you know, people, liberals, to just 
maybe let Lauren Boebert and Marjorie Taylor Greene be as crazy as they, in fact, encourage them to be even more crazy because it makes the entire Republican Party look bad. It tars them by association, which will ultimately help Democrats. No, no, I'm not saying they're not going to fundraise off of it because it is what it is and this is politics and that's how you get into office. But no, it's not being actively encouraged by the left. I hear conversation after conversation of people wishing for the simpler days of George W. Bush, which is horrifying considering what we all actually felt when he was the president. This is, you know, to overuse a phrase that we've used 19 times in this segment already, this is beyond the pay. We would never, ever, ever encourage Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert to lean into their Islamophobia, their homophobia, their racism, and their just all around ridiculousness. They tarnish American democracy and we want them out of office as soon as possible, even if that means we don't get to fundraise off of their ridiculousness anymore. Mm. Well, you gotta leave it there. Jennifer and Rachel, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks guys. Thank you. And we'll have more Rising right after this.